Welcome to Success in Medicine. I'm Dr. Samir Desai. In the past five years, I've had the chance to talk with a number of psychiatry residency program directors. There's one thing that keeps coming up time and time again in these conversations, and that's the number of applications programs are receiving from applicants. Many programs are receiving record numbers of applications, mainly because applicants are applying to so many more programs than ever before. Programs that are on the receiving end of this avalanche of applications often find it difficult to determine which applicants are truly interested in their training program. Per the words of Dr. Richard Summers, former co-director of the Psychiatry Residency Training Program at the University of Pennsylvania. And I quote, the volume of applications imposes on the program an imperative to find an inevitably non-rational way to sort out who they are going to interview with the result that a lot of excellent people may get overlooked. Being overlooked is a concern that many applicants have. How can you avoid being overlooked? In today's episode of the Success in Medicine podcast, you'll hear from Dhruv Gupta, a student at the St. George's University Medical School who just received some great news. He got into psychiatry. Dhruv will take us through his journey to psychiatry, and along the way, he'll share some important advice recommendations that will surely help you maximize your chances of success in the psychiatry residency match. Drew, welcome to the Success in Medicine podcast. I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you for having me, Dr. Desai. Drew, I want to start by talking a bit about your background. I know that you were born in Mumbai, but I understand that you and your family moved around as you were growing up? Yeah, Dr. Desai, I was actually born in Mumbai, India, as you mentioned, but I have actually grown up living in multiple different countries and have had the ability to experience diverse cultures. After India, I lived in Thailand and then in Venezuela and later moved to the U.S. and finished high school in Houston and then moved to New Orleans for my undergraduate and graduate education at Tulane. Then I moved to England for my first year of medical school at SGU and on to Grenada for my second year. And presently, I'm completing my fourth year electives between Miami and New York City. And in addition, I've also lived in Bangladesh and Canada. And living abroad has really been a rewarding experience. In addition to being exposed to diverse cultures and people of varied creed, The greatest benefit of growing internationally really was the gift of becoming an adaptable person. Moving to a different city and country about every three years really required me to constantly readjust to my surroundings. I've had to make new friends, learn novel ways in which to communicate and embrace different cultural practices. And these practices have really helped me hone my interpersonal skills and have taught me to readily readjust and adapt to novel settings. And the ease with which I'm able to do so really helped me tremendously over my medical school clinical core rotations where I've had to move from hospital to hospital which serve different sorts of populations from different cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds. And then you you made your way to New Orleans, where you went to college at Tulane University, and you majored in psychology. Why did you pick psychology? Psychology, I mean, it's just been, been an area that I've always been interested in. I think living abroad was has been the primary reason that has triggered my interest in psychology. Growing up, I was always curious to understand what motivates human behavior, and part of that really stems from witnessing a lot of hardships that others encounter in living in developing nations. I was able to see, for instance, in Thailand, a lot of young teenage girls being forced into prostitution, or in Bangladesh, we witnessed young children being forced into a well-organized business where their limbs are amputated so that they're forced to beg, or in Caracas, where 
young ch- young children and teenagers are also being forced or being taught how to handle machine guns and guns as the political situation took a toll there and such experiences really led me to wonder what motivates human behavior and also to just understand better what is it like to live a life which is surrounded by so much oppression and curious about these questions and wanting to seek an answer I went and went ahead and took AP psychology in high school where I really got a foundation of what psychology is the various fields that exist in psychology and also was introduced to some of the psychopathologies that exist. So psychology was something that I I was really interested in coming into Tulane, and I knew that one of my majors or one area that I would be exploring would be psychology. And so while you were at Tulane as an undergraduate student, you were majoring in psychology, and, and you clearly enjoyed your major because you chose to, after graduation, complete your master's in psychology. And And during that year, you were involved in several interesting research projects. Can you tell us about these projects? Yeah, most definitely. I was actually involved in a number of research projects, both over my undergrad and my master's year. But one particular research project that we could talk about is the study that led to my honors thesis. I conducted a research study with the department chair which investigated the role of physician feedback on patient compliance to prescribe treatment regimen. Specifically, I wanted to see if there was anything that physicians and healthcare providers can do differently in terms of the feedback they provide to patients so that they could advance higher levels of compliance. In particular, I designed a study to assess if physicians can provide feedback that relays shared responsibility through pronoun manipulation, where they use second person plural, second person singular pronouns versus first person plural, and if and if it would lead to higher levels of compliance. And over the process, I wrote an IRB, filmed four different physician patient interactions, recruited over 80 participants, I collected and coded and analyzed data, and the results indicated that patients evince higher levels of compliance, that is satisfaction, comprehension, and motivation when physicians instill ownership and sufficiently attend to their condition. And while this was a more psychology-heavy research study that I took part in, there was another study. I was involved in collaboration with the Department of Neuroscience at Tulane and Tulane's Institute of Sports Medicine, and the focus of this research study was to establish normative data for performance on on the Montreal Cognitive Assessment amongst student-athletes. There was research that we conducted on high school athletes with the objective of improving procedures that are utilized to diagnose and treat concussions in this population as athletes at that age began to experience concussions for the first time. And my role was to lead preparation of the IRB, recruit participants, and administer and score assessments that led to data analysis. And results, again, indicated that much like in the adult population, MOCA scores are sensitive to age and the number of concussions an individual has had previously. And the data that we gathered on this study later guided screening of adolescents who potentially may have encountered a concussion in the past. And this project was unique for me in the sense that I had experience with writing an IRB and data analysis from my own honors thesis. And I was able to guide several of the students and introduce them to various statistical analysis procedures as well. And I really, and through this experience, I gathered gathered knowledge on how to really lead a research project with others in a team. So in a sense, this project not only furthered my knowledge on concussions, but also taught me better the process of conducting research. And there was another study I was involved in, which dealt with opioid synthesis with the Department of Neuroscience, which was one where we assessed the efficacy of a synthetic opioid compound while also assessing how addictive it is. And my tasks involved helping the senior graduate students implant cannulas in the mice and prepare slides with sections of mice spinal cord. And the study was the first which introduced me to working with animal models and 
preparing slides required me to be exact and highly precise. But most meaningful was the fact that the study broadened my knowledge on the properties of opioids and triggered a personal interest in pain management, which is an area I would like to explore over my residency training and possibly after residency pursue a fellowship in. So I was definitely involved in a number of research projects over my undergraduate and master's um, career at Tulane, and I have really enjoyed them all. Well, thank you for sharing your research background with us. It's clear that you were involved in some very, very interesting work, and the work that you did obviously helped you build an important skill set and also gave you some insight into the direction in which your career might go uh, down the road. Most definitely. I mean, the research I did really helped guide my future clinical interactions with patients as well. For instance, the study I did on um, feedback that is provided by physicians to see how patients stay compliant with their treatment guided my own interactions in medical school because I used what I gathered from that study to shape my communication with patients as well. And I noted a significant difference whenever I spoke in that manner and how patients would remain compliant or more willing to accept feedback that we were providing them. Absolutely. And and this topic is so very important. Uh, you know, Drew, that I am a hospitalist at, at the Baylor College of Medicine, and when I am on the wards at the VA hospital, I regularly deal with issues related to compliance. And so often we get these histories where, you know, the patient is not compliant with his medications, and it can be so very challenging to determine the factor or factors that are preventing them from being compliant. And I'm always in search of strategies and techniques that I can use to increase compliance in my patients. And um, this is uh, great to hear about your research, and it's definitely something that I need to explore a bit more. I want to also now talk about, you know, you wrapped up at Tulane. Here you've done your undergraduate, and you've also gotten your graduate degree, your master's degree in psychology. And after that, you went to medical school and your path led you to St. George's University. And I wonder if you can tell us what the SGU experience was like. Yeah, as a medical student at SGU, I mean, I've had an excellent experience from year one all the way through this point out when I'm a fourth year student. And my first year was spent in Newcastle, England. And the reason why it was spent in England is that SGU students have the option to elect either to do their first year in England as part of the Global Scholars Program or in the Caribbean. And for those students who want to go to England, there's only a small number of positions available. And I was fortunate to be one of 30 students who spent their entire first year in England. And what was wonderful about the program was the teacher to student ratio there. We had about 17 faculty members, if I remember correctly, for about 30 students. And That was wonderful because there was an unlimited amount of resources available to us students and there was, we never had to set any appointments to go meet with any of the faculty members. It was always an open door policy. And while in England, in addition to attending classes, I also elected to do an early clinical exposure elective, which allowed me to shadow doctors in various specialties and hence also exposed me to the healthcare system in England. After my first year in England, I came to Grenada for my second year. And while on the island, in addition to classroom instruction, I felt that as you did a great job of placing a strong emphasis on teaching students physical exam and clinical communication skills, which I felt helped me tremendously on my step two CS exam. And I was able to put to use my history taking and physical exam skills at community health fairs in Grenada as well through the American Medical Student Association chapter at the school, which allowed me to interact and medically serve community members there. And after my time on the island, I came to Miami where I completed my core rotations and I'm presently doing my fourth year electives between Miami and New York City. So overall, my experience at SGU, I think, has been wonderful, both professionally and on a personal level. I want to take you back to your first year of medical school and to your first term. 
Uh, and during that time, there were several unexpected things that happened, and the things that happened did take a toll on your ability to perform at your usual high levels. Can you tell us what happened? Prior to starting medical school, actually, I had injured my back and developed a herniated disc for which I was receiving physical therapy. And once I got to England, I was unable to schedule a physical therapy appointment because of the relatively long wait. And over the first and second weeks of classes without any sort of therapy, I began experiencing back pain again. And I was dealing with this terrible back pain and I could not longer sit for long stretches of time to study. And shortly before, in addition to that, shortly before starting medical school, something rather traumatic, very scary happened to our family where everybody was tied down while we lived in Venezuela and we were robbed at gunpoint. And in addition to experiencing back pain at the time, somehow this incident really started to impact me. And I would think back to it from time to time. And because of the nature of these events, both my physical health and also dealing with what had happened at home, I knew that I was falling behind in work. And the best thing at the time was really to tend to my health. And so I took a leave of absence at that point and gathered some physical therapy that I needed to get back on my feet and then came back to medical school the following term. Thank you for sharing that with us because in medical school, it was hard enough as it is. And then when things happen to us in our, in our lives, certain life situations like our, our health or, or what you went through, which I can't even imagine being, being robbed at, at gunpoint, we have no control over when those things can happen to us. And then when they happen to us in medical school, it can be so very difficult to deal with. And I was fortunate to go through medical school without any issues with my own health and certainly I didn't go through anything that you went through uh, with being robbed, but I have heard from so many medical students over the years about different life situations, and what I've gathered from these experiences is just learn so much about medical students and, and their makeup and how they pick themselves back up and how they persevere, and, and I've heard some very, very inspiring stories, so it sounds like you went through a lot. Through the process, like you mentioned, I felt I wasn't the only one who struggled. There were times when I met others having, I mean, life has, continues to happen over medical school. I had other friends, close friends who lost family members. And it's a challenge at times to just keep pushing with the rigors of medical school and also dealing with what life is throwing at you. And sometimes it is wise. And appropriate, at least as it was in my case, to tell yourself, I think it's time to take some time off, or it's wise to do that, and then come back fully recovered or better, or in a better shape to take on the challenges of medical school. So in hindsight, I'm really glad that I took the time off to attend to my health and then come back to school. And while you were at SGU, you had this wonderful opportunity to travel to India where you did a rural medical selective and you were rotating through different specialties, one of which was psychiatry. I would imagine that this was an eye-opening experience. Definitely. And I think one of the benefits of being an SGU student is the ability to take part in various overseas selectives through these schools, partnerships with institutions overseas. And Students have the ability to pursue medical selectives in various fields ranging in diverse locations from Kenya to Czech Republic to India to Thailand and many other sites. And as you mentioned, I did a rural medical selective in India in Karad with, at the Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences. Karad is a small rural city or town in the state of Maharashtra in India. I've never been there before. We, the group of students landed in Mumbai and then we drove on a bus for about 10 hours to reach the location. And I did this selective after the first term of my medical school. And over my time there, we rotated through various departments, pediatrics, internal medicine, radiology, oncology, surgery, OB-GYN, and psychiatry, as you mentioned. And 
What was really wonderful to note was despite the limited facilities available in comparison to most healthcare facilities that I have rotated in in the U.S., it was great to see how efficiently the healthcare providers were still able to care for their patients and also with a great sense of compassion. And I was particularly impressed to see that despite the fact that they had limited facilities in the Department of Psychiatry, I was impressed to see how much time the doctors were really, the psychiatrists were spending with their patients and also the level of counseling services that was available to patients. Although there was stigma that had to be fought, patients were being actively encouraged to gather the care that they needed with examples of medical needs that patients clearly go ahead and get treatment for. And I really was encouraged to see that because from this particular experience, I really came to understand that medicine is a field which asks healthcare providers to step out of their comfort zones and help those whom we are working with. And on top of the experience, aside from the actual time that we spend in the hospital or at different medical sites, there were several social events and trips that were organized for students as well. It was a great opportunity to meet other students from SGU as well. I had come in from England and there were some students who had come in from Grenada and some of the friends I made over that trip still continue to remain some of my closest friends. And I was also able to see a rural town in India, which, which I had never been able to do in the past. Where did you do your psychiatry core rotation and what was that experience like? I did my psychiatry core rotation at the University of Miami Jackson Behavioral Health Center, and I think I had the most phenomenal experience rotating there. We started early. We started around 6 a.m. every day, or and we got in a little bit earlier, the students. We pre-rounded on our patients, and then as a team with the attending, interviewed each of our patients, and after that, discussed their cases and went over their treatment plan. And we rotated through different units within Jackson Behavioral's, um, Behavioral Health Center. We rotated through the adult behavioral treatment department through chemical dependency, geriatrics, and their child psychiatry unit. And it was my first opportunity to be able to work with psychiatry patients one-on-one. -on -one. And up until this time, I only loved psychiatry from the knowledge I had from books or from research studies. But this was the very first time I worked with actual patients with mental health care needs. And I enjoyed it just as much or if not more than over, over my previous years of education where I learned about psychology and became familiar with the field. And what was so wonderful was just being able to work with patients one-on-one, -on -one, reach every corner of their minds and help them reclaim their lives. It was a fabulous experience. And I am so glad I had the particular experience I did as it really furthered my interest in psychiatry. So I want to ask you, I know you went into SGU thinking about psychiatry as a career would you say that after your core rotation in Miami that you were 100% convinced that psychiatry was your calling? I went into medical school thinking that, I mean, I knew that psychiatry was a field that I'm really passionate about, and I was pretty much certain that that's what I'm going, that's the field that I would go on to do, I mean, go on to pursue a career in. And over medical school, I mean, over basic sciences years, that interest remained strong. And my first clinical rotation was actually psychiatry, my core rotation. It just happened to be the way it was scheduled. And I really enjoyed my rotation, and I loved what I did there, and I could see myself doing that professionally. But at the same time, as I started each of my clinical rotations, what I made sure to do was start each rotation with a clear mind and not have any preconceived notions guiding my time in that particular specialty. And I found myself to also have really enjoyed ob and internal medicine. And I gave considerable thought to those two fields as well when it came time to apply for a residency for residency but at the end of the day I just knew that I was most passionate about psychiatry and while 
I enjoyed these other specialties as well, I would thrive personally in psychiatry. And over my time in fourth year psychiatry electives, I felt that a lot of the psychiatry patients that we work with have other medical needs as well that as psychiatrists that we can attend to. At the end of the day, I'm really happy with the choice I've made and my rotation at Jackson really furthered my decision to go into psychiatry and I'm glad I stuck with it. Drew, I want to talk a bit about away rotations in psychiatry. Away rotations in psychiatry are not considered necessary to match into the specialty, but sometimes students have compelling reasons to do these rotations. Did you do any away rotations in psychiatry? Yeah, I actually did. And I know it's not traditional. I mean, it's not highly encouraged to do away rotations, but I went ahead and scheduled three away rotations, actually. I'd been in Miami for all of my third-year core rotations, and then I did another fourth-year elective at University of Miami. But I went ahead and scheduled three in New York City. And the goal was just to, at this point when I was scheduling these electives was to look at SGU's previous match lists and see where have SGU students matched in psychiatry, at what hospitals or at what programs, and then from that list to find programs that or hospitals that are affiliated with SGU as their clinical sites. And I scheduled three rotations at three different sites. I did a month of emergency psychiatry CPEP at Elmhurst Hospital, and then I did a month of inpatient psychiatry at Lincoln Hospital, and I was scheduled to do a another elective in chemical dependency at, at Metropolitan Hospital in New York City, but somehow schedule changed, and I do, I'm doing a month of consult liaison psychiatry at Elmhurst as well. And I think my experiences over my over my away rotations have been such that when you are rotating somewhere for a month and if you're also interviewing at that place, your rotation essentially takes takes greater value than your interview of one day. And if you work diligently and showcase a genuine interest in the patients and the field, that goes far ways in terms of relaying that you would be a good fit at the program. And it also gives you a great opportunity to assess whether that program would be a good fit for yourself and if you would be happy there. And I personally enjoyed one of my rotations very much and another one at another program I did not like so much. So that gave me a sense of how I wanted to go forward with the interview process. And and sometimes it really helps to do these rotations without even me asking at one of the locations a few of the attendings wrote a note to the program director prior to my interview recommending me and that definitely helped me immensely over over the application process but i mean it also while it's really beneficial it comes with its a few disadvantages as well it requires you to constantly keep moving from one location to another i've had to move to a different location because the hospitals have been in different boroughs of New York City. I've had to move every four weeks, and moves are not inexpensive. They come at an added cost, and you have had to bear those, and also had to take away time to move and readjust. But I feel because of my life experiences of having had to move so much, it wasn't as much of a challenge. And I've really enjoyed my away rotations for the most part. Drew, thank you very much for that very informative insight into away electives in psychiatry. And we have a lot more that we want to discuss with you. This is just part one of our series with you. And what I hope to cover in the next episode, part two, will be a focus on letters of recommendation for psychiatry residency programs, as well as an in-depth look into the psychiatry residency interview. And I know that the next episode, part two with Dhruv Gupta, will prove to be as revealing as part one has been so far. So I want to thank Dhruv 
for joining us and I want to encourage you to join us again for part two in the near future. As always, we have a tremendous amount of information about the residency selection process, including detailed information about psychiatry on our website, thesuccessfulmatch.com. In closing, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to having you join us again on the next episode of the Success in Medicine podcast. Until next time, I'm Dr. Samir Desai.